Welcome back, everyone, to another installment of Space This Week, the show in which we cover all the news related to space this and week. But to be slightly more uh, descriptive, <laughs> we'll be recapping all of the best spaceflight and starship development events that occurred over the past week, preview and get hyped for all the launches and events planned to take place this week, and then we'll meander down the fascinating annals of history and take a look at all of the greatest spaceflight anniversaries that'll be taking place over the next seven days. Before we get started good and proper, make sure you hit the subscribe button down below so that you see these episodes when they first come out, so that the news is as fresh and and relevant as possible. And with that, take your protein pills, put your helmets on, and get ready to sit back and relax to our first segment, all the stuff that happened last week. Without a doubt, the most exciting event that occurred last week was the successful surface sample collection from asteroid 101955 Bennu, which was conducted by NASA's OSIRIS-REx probe on Tuesday the 20th of October. The OSIRIS-REx mission was launched four years ago in September 2016 aboard an Atlas V rocket. The mission's primary objective was to obtain a minimum of 60 grams from the surface of asteroid 101955 Bennu and return the sample to Earth for detailed analysis. After arriving at the asteroid approximately two years after launch, the probe spent a further two years carefully scanning and analyzing Bennu's surface to try and find the best spot to cruise down and nab the sample from. And it was last week that it performed this historic maneuver. The probe carefully descended to the dark surface of Bennu, and upon touchdown, the sample acquisition kit at the end of the probe's robotic arm fired a burst of nitrogen gas to blow surface particles into the sample ahead. This operation lasted for around five seconds before the spacecraft began to back away from the surface slowly. Shortly afterward, it was confirmed that the probe had managed to acquire a little over its 60 gram target, and the mission controllers are proceeding with stowing the material into storage aboard the sample return capsule. This capsule will be jettisoned from the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft and will return to Earth on the 24th of September, seven years after launch. Our next bit of news was the successful launch of Starlink 15, which flew aboard a Falcon 9 rocket on the 24th of October, adding a further 60 satellites to SpaceX's Starlink constellation. When complete, this constellation will provide the world with high-speed internet access. The first stage booster landed on the drone ship, just read the instructions, approximately eight and a half minutes after liftoff, marking this booster's third successful landing. The satellites deployed about 50 minutes later. Our final launch from last week was the Soyuz GLONASS K mission, which launched on October 25th from the Plesetska Cosmodrome in Russia. We've already talked about this launch prospectively a few times on Space This Week, owing to this mission's delays from August and earlier this month, but it's nice to see the mighty Soyuz finally take flight. The GLONASS K satellites are spacecraft that will serve Russia's GLONASS positioning and timing network. And now it's time to head on over to Boca Chica to take a look at how SpaceX's Starship development is going. And the news is big, ladies and gentlemen. Last week, we saw the successful pairing of Starship SN8's nose cone with its booster. This great video by Austin Barnard really puts into perspective the sheer scale of this beast. This was done not long after SpaceX had conducted the SN8 static fire test of all three of its Raptor engines, the final test required before the latest and greatest iteration of Starship can embark on its primary mission, fly 15 kilometers into the sky, and touch down again. It will be the first practical demonstration of the Starship's structure at high altitude, and will certainly be an impressive sight to see. In other Starship news, we caught glimpses of a white nose cone emblazoned with the NASA Worm logo parked up next to the SN5 prototype. It's unclear at this stage what the purpose of this nose cone is, but there's speculation it might be mounted to the SN5 to serve as a full-scale mock-up of SpaceX's moon lander for NASA's Artemis program. In other Boca Chica news, the high base structure is almost complete and Starship's SN9 to SN11 and the Super Heavy booster continue being fabricated. Covering Starship is always exciting and I can't wait to watch all of the new developments that SpaceX has lined up for us. But now, it's time to leave Boca Chica and head on over to our next segment of the show. But before we do that, guys, if you are enjoying this video so far, then don't forget to hit that like button down below. But with that, let's move right along to discussing all of the launches planned for the next few days. 
We kick off this week's launches today, October 26th, where we will bear witness to a Long March 2C, which will carry three Yeogen 3007 surveillance satellites into orbit for the Chinese military. The rocket will launch from Zichang, China, and will be the 54th flight of this rocket. Next up, we have the 28th of October launch of Rocket Lab's In Focus mission, which will launch from the Mahia Peninsula in New Zealand aboard an Electron rocket. We talked about this mission in last week's video as this launch was originally planned for October the 20th, but it was unfortunately pushed forward to this week due to poor weather forecast. The In Focus mission earned its nickname from its payload, an Earth Imaging Microsatellite for Canon Electronics and nine Earth Imaging Nanosatellites for Planet. Electron launches are always fun to watch. I, I think there's something about the amazing launch location and the sleek design of the rocket itself that really ties it all together for me. Electron is an expendable launch system at the moment, but at some point in the future, Rocket Lab has stated intent to try and recover the first stage via a mid-air catch with a helicopter, something I can't wait to see. On the spookiest day of the week, October 31st, we will see another Chinese rocket launch, this time a Long March 6, which will carry two Quilu Earth observation satellites into low Earth orbit from the Taiwan Launch Center in China. We wrap up the week with three possible launches. Our first maybe flight is the Falcon 9 Enrol 108 launch of a classified payload for the US National Reconnaissance Office, which was unfortunately delayed from October 25th. No definite date has been set for the next launch attempt, but with a bit of luck, it might happen some point this week. Speaking of delayed Falcon 9s, the GPS-3 mission for the US Air Force was meant to fly aboard SpaceX's workhorse rocket in late September, but was scrubbed just two seconds before launch. Again, no date has been set for a re-attempt, but it could happen over the next seven days if we're lucky. Finally, and you all knew this was coming, we have the maybe launch of the Delta IV Heavy, which has started to become a regular feature of this show given its ongoing delays. The Delta IV Heavy is the biggest rocket in the United Launch Alliance's fleet and has attempted to launch quite a few times since September. Its payload is a classified spy satellite from the US National Reconnaissance Office, and it's quite unlikely that this rocket will launch this week, but there's always hope, and I love watching this B-roll of the Delta IV Heavy launch the Parker Solar Probe, so any excuse to reuse it is something I'm going to take. But it's our final maybe launch, and as such is the final story in this segment of the show, which means it's time for our final stage, all the best historic spaceflight anniversaries that'll be taking place over the next seven days. This week's history celebration begins tomorrow on October the 27th when we'll be able to celebrate the anniversary of the Saturn Apollo 1 launch which was the first flight of a Saturn class rocket and the first mission of the American Apollo program. The rocket was launched from Cape Canaveral in 1961 and was a huge increase in power and size over anything launched before it. The flight was a test of the launch vehicle's structure, specifically to test the first stage assembly, and as such only the first stage of this rocket was live. NASA opted to test each rocket stage in separate launches, and it wouldn't be until the Saturn 1's fifth flight that it would have a live second stage and achieve orbit. The Saturn 1 would end up being succeeded by the more powerful Saturn 1B, which would be used to test various Apollo systems ahead of the massive Saturn 5, which was of course the rocket that would take astronauts to the surface of the moon and, as of 2020, remains the tallest, heaviest and most powerful rocket ever brought to operational status and holds the record for heaviest payload launched and largest payload capacity to low Earth orbit. It's not just the anniversary of the Saturn 1's premiere that we'll be able to celebrate tomorrow on October the 27th, as on the same day in 1994, Glyes 229b was discovered, which was the first substellar mass object to be unambiguously discovered. Glyes 229b is a brown dwarf and is one half of the Glyes 229 binary system, with the other half being the red dwarf Glyes 229a. A brown dwarf is too small to sustain nuclear fusion like a main sequence star, but with a mass of 21 to 52 times that of Jupiter, it is still far too massive to be a planet. A red dwarf, on the other hand, is the smallest and coolest kind of star in the main sequence, and they are estimated to compromise approximately three quarters of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. Unfortunately, October 28th carries some less positive anniversaries. First up is in 1971 in England land, <laughs> when the British satellite Prospero was launched atop a British Black Arrow rocket. 
Well, the mission was successful and was the first successful flight of the Black Arrow rocket, the Ministry of Defense decided to celebrate this achievement by cancelling the Black Arrow program in favor of just using the American Scout rocket instead, making Britain the first and only country to develop an orbital class rocket and in doing so becoming an orbital capable nation and then deciding to just give up this ability. While I'm sure that the financial statistics make the cancellation the correct choice, it does sting a bit in my ever-diminishing sense of national pride. Rest in peace, you ridiculous flying lipstick, you. But I do hope any Americans in the comments aren't scoffing too hard, as our next anniversary is the 2009 launch of the Ares 1X rocket, the only launch of this rocket and the Constellation program as a whole, being cancelled the moment it proved its functionality, much like the Black Arrow. This ridiculous looking vehicle was proposed as a rocket that would replace the space shuttle as NASA's human spaceflight vehicle. The first stage is a solid rocket booster lifted straight out of the space shuttle inventory to make things as cheap as possible. Marvel at this footage, it's the only time you'll ever get to see this top-heavy firework in flight. On the same day, again in 2014 this time, NASA's Cygnus CRS Orb 3 resupply mission to the International Space Station explodes! Man, what is it about October 28th? <laughs> A few seconds after taking off from the Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport in Virginia. The explosion was caused by a failure of propulsion in the Antares rocket's first stage, causing the whole thing to start falling back down to the launch pad. The range safety officer engaged the flight termination system just before impact, resulting in this very expensive firework display. Luckily, being a simple resupply mission, there was no loss of life or injury, though the explosion did severely damage the launch pad and presumably the payload. <laughs> the next day, October 29th, bears a more positive anniversary. In 1991, two months after entering the asteroid belt, the American Galileo probe performed the first asteroid encounter by a spacecraft, passing around 1,600 kilometers above 951 Gaspra. The spacecraft took several images of the asteroid, revealing it to be a cratered and irregular body, measuring around 19 by 12 by 11 kilometers. Our final anniversary is a biggie, and is the October 31st launch of Soyuz TM-31, which took place in the year 2000. This was a significant flight because on board was the first resident crew assigned to the International Space Station, and in the 20 years since this flight, the International Space Station has been crewed continuously. Of course, back then, the station was much smaller than it is today, but with funding only set to last until 2024, it's unlikely we'll see any further expansion to the world's most expensive LEGO set. And that's about all we've got time for in this week's installment of Space History This Week. Ladies and gentlemen, another week has elapsed, another week is upon us, and I for one am very excited to see all of the planned launches hopefully unfold without a hitch, and of course, am very excited to celebrate the week's spaceflight anniversaries as they roll around. I do very much hope you enjoyed today's episode of Space This Week. Let me know what you thought of it down below, and if it's worthy of a like, then it's always appreciated. There should now be an end screen in front of you. To the left is a link to the full Space This Week playlist. The right hand side is a video that YouTube's AI think you'll like based on your viewing history. Hopefully it made a good pick. I'm going to wrap things up on my part now. Thank you so much for watching and I hope you all have an excellent week.